on the topic of getting old, getting old uh, memory and mode. Uh, Dr. Nadat Khatri is a family medicine specialist in Georgetown, Texas. She graduated with honors from University of Arkansas College of Medicine in 2014. Having more than three years of diverse experience, especially in family medicine, geriatric medicine, uh, we're glad she's here. This is sort of an, an ongoing topic for our families with aging parents. And as we get old and we kind of understand our own illnesses. So I'm hoping we'll have, get, gain more insight and have more questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to have Dr. Nodat Khadi take over. Thank you, Nodat, for your time. I appreciate this. Well, you're most welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa rakatahu. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina Muhammad. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa sirli amri wa hlul uqdatan milisani afqahu qawli. Um, I am Dr. Khatri. I am one of the uh, family practitioners um, who, pra who has been practicing in Georgetown uh, for the past um, six and a half years. Um, Alhamdulillah, I have, it's been a pleasure and honor to be um, in Texas and doing um, the safety net um, practice that I am with the Lone Star Circle of Care um, for the past. And I do a senior clinic. I graduated from uh, family medicine uh, in 2014, then moved on to do a geriatrics fellowship, which I had never heard of when I was doing medicine myself, but learned more into during my residency and um, stay here that there is something called as learning about older people and how aging is different and how care of the aged is different than the routine care for the you know, uh, younger adults. And that brought a lot of interest. Um, I had uh, the passion and the compassion for it and um, the patience, alhamdulillah, for it for a while and then uh, to learn and serve this population with uh, a lot of pleasure. And, I want to talk about certain things that I have seen over my practice and um, being a part of the community and even just amongst families and how we can recognize certain things early and um, help our um, our parents, grandparents, uh, whoever we care for and for our own selves as we age and um, how, what can we do to help our own selves, you know, and uh, to age healthy, which is a very important um, thing now that we see the longevity um, increasing, like we live more years, the life expectancy is much better compared to what it was uh, many years ago. So my topic for today mainly is getting old memory and mood. And there is a very common um, myth that if somebody is old, their their memory is going to fail or they're going to not remember certain things. They're going to have problems. They're going to have certain physical issues as well as what we call in medical terms cognitive or thinking or um, processing faster, doing things uh, as they used to. They It is just expected that we all have this tendency, oh, he's very old. He's, they're just very old. That's why they're like that. They just, my parents are very old, so they're getting old. And that's why uh, this is happening to them. So I want to discuss a little about what is a, how do we age? Um, and what is the normal aspect of aging? How, how much of it is normal? And where should you start seeing those red flags or certain things that will trigger for you to seek more help? And how, as uh, com as uh, the patients themselves or somebody who's going through this or as a family member, you can help with finding this out early, um, helping them get a proper diagnosis or see somebody who can help them get a complete evaluation. And what does an evaluation involve? What does that mean? What is um, What do doctors do to find this out? Is there a blood test? Is there a, um, an imaging test? Is there something that we do to find this out? Is there something available to treat this? Can we just go back to how they were? 
and what can we do as caregivers and what challenges caregivers face. And if we have any caregivers here in listening to me today, I am very happy to hear you and your experiences and everything and, um, you know, help in what, way, what, what best ways we can. So what is our brain, subhanAllah, is a very, very complex structure within our body as everything else is but um, it has such a powerful function in our body to take care of things that um, memory is a very important part it remembers what it has to it eliminates what it does not need and so as you age, as we grow older, and when, when we say old, it is usually beyond 60 years, and especially 65 plus, that we start noticing certain changes that happen. And what is normal? Somebody who is forgetful. Oh, we have somebody who wants to um, explain in Urdu. If you have anything specific, I will, inshallah, try to address your questions in that. Um, but for the sake of everybody, we'll keep this topic in English, inshallah. Um, and you're more than welcome to ask the questions in Urdu and we can... Yes, absolutely. Um, we will, inshallah, give you a chance to ask in Urdu and I can summarize a bit for you in the end of it, inshallah, and take it from there. Um, so forgetting things, like if you were just to um, go to a, have a breakfast in the morning and then evening you forgot what you had for breakfast or what you did yesterday, or you forgot, forgot somebody's name, but you gave it a thought for a few minutes and then you remembered it. It came back to you. It was not a problem. It just, oh, I forgot, who is that? But you thought of it and then it comes back to you. That is normal. That is, that is a normal part of aging. That happen, that'll happen to most of us as we will grow old. But those things come back to us. Maybe our mind is occupied at that time with another thought. And that once that goes away, then you are able to remember, oh, this is what it was. This is what I wanted to do. This is why I came to this room. This is what was happening. Where did I put the keys? Oh, maybe, you know, let me look in there. Let me find this out. That is that can be normal if that just happens, you know, randomly once few times in a week, it comes back to you. You're OK, but it happens. Something like that happens to the extent that you are your normal functioning is being affected. Somebody is repeating that again and again. You just ate breakfast and two hours later, you're again like, oh, I'm eating again because I didn't eat breakfast that is not normal or your parent or your older adult is just asking you the same question you went out for instance and then you're like oh where did you go and you answered their question and there is barely 10 or 30 minutes passed away they asked you where did you go and you go like oh i just told you i went there it's like no i you didn't tell me you didn't tell me anything where did you go and then again, you repeat that same answer. Again, it's it's a repetitive pattern. They ask you the same thing again and again and again. That is not normal. That is not a part of your normal aging. And somebody who's able to carry out. So if you have, for instance, what do we say carry out their daily task? This can be very different in different people. Somebody who's been a homemaker for their life who's been in home, taken care of children, done cooking, cleaning, they are able to do that. They're able to cook, they're able to clean, they're able to do the laundry, fold their laundry, do the tasks that they were doing before. That's okay. They may have a bit of hindrance, but they are able to. They don't just cook and they forget to put, you know, half of the ingredients or they cook completely different one time, completely different another time. They turn the gas stove on left it on and nobody's aware until the food is burnt multiple times leave 
that's that's just not normal. If they were doing these functions before without a problem, and then suddenly your mother or your grandmother's not able to cook now, and she's just very forgetful, she is not cooking the same that you saw them before, that's not a part of normal aging. There is something going on. And we need to try to find that out and try to help them. The ability to learn new things. This is very interesting because um, as now we have more of, you know, educated a community who has seeked at least a high school diploma further. And we are seeking new information. We are learning new information every day with this growing age and technology and everything. You're um, learning new things and you want to say, do some other, learn a new, um, a new skill or learn a new language or learn even for memorizing the Quran, do, doing certain things that you want to learn something new. It can be hard. That is okay. With age, learning new things gets more difficult but it doesn't become impossible. Somebody with a memory impairment or having an issue with their, with their brain functioning, they, for them, it is very difficult. No matter how many times you repeat the same information, no matter how you change the explanation, they are not, not able to get it. They will not able to learn it. Something that we very commonly, very commonly see is um, I see a lot of people come when they're about to give their citizenship exams. And they're like, oh, we're trying to learn. They're trying to learn English and they're trying to read this book and they're not able to. They just cannot. And it makes them so scared and they are just crying. Some of them are like, no, I cannot do this. I am not able to learn. They tried. Mind you, they have tried. They have read it. They have tried their best and they were able to read. They were able to do things but they're just not able to do that. At that time, it is like an aha moment for them. It's like, oh, we are not able to learn anymore or we were probably able to do this 10 years ago, but now something's wrong. Something is not right here. And then it, it kind of um, triggers an investigation and to see what is going on. Why is the memory like that? And if there is any underlying problem that has happened that was just not noticed because some of these changes can be very subtle. And with our culture, especially, it is not noticed very easily. Um, in the Western culture, it is very common for the older adults to be living independently, even up to the age of 80 and 90 years, if they can. And they are able to carry out their routine activities. They go driving, they go doing their things, carry out their financial activity, everything by themselves. They don't have people involved in their uh, matters. Unless the family starts seeing problems or somebody else starts noticing problems or they themselves start seeing something different, then they come to the doctors and seek help. But with our culture, mashallah, we are we are still in a very um, a setting where we are we take care of our elders. That's a part of our responsibility. We take that as a honor for us to be able to care for them and to be able to be there and um, help them in whatever they would need. So as our elders age we don't want them to do a lot of things as it is we don't want them to be cooking around we don't want them to be you know doing the things they were previously doing which by part can can be a bit limiting for them because one of the things that increases their life itself is their activity their physical activity their involvement their their being independent as much as they can so it is a factor for uh, living longer. So if somebody is doing that, I would encourage, let them, let them do something in the house. Let them be um, doing things around that they were able to. That make, not only makes them happy and feel like they have a purpose to do things, that keeps them sharp. That keeps their memory uh, intact. They are going to feel happy and they're going to live longer with that inshallah so um with definitely be mindful of these things but let them do things um when we say there is no un yes sorry this may be a little preemptive question before um 
you probably had this slide, but I was just wondering, you mentioned the uh, exam, right? So that's a comes with a lot of anxiety in itself. I'm oh, yes, curious. absolutely. No, I, I will explain the exam. Um, and I will also tell why it doesn't so that's work. That's what you're trying to say, right? The anxieties, you have ruled out anxiety and sort of sadness that might come, which might present with some forgetfulness. Absolutely. I, I definitely that I will touch base with that. Definitely. I will um, in the in um, later, I will come with that. Okay. The Sounds underlying what I want to say is there are certain underlying medical conditions that when you are thinking that somebody is um, is having this problem um, of dementia, what we call uh, memory loss, um, the the cognitive dysfunction or what we the memory is gone it has certain medical conditions can present like that which could be a thyroid issue it could be a vitamin deficiency the diseases like diabetes blood pressure um, people who've had stroke in the past those can also present with certain things and um and that's very different. That presentation can also occur. So that those things also have to be treated very well. They have to be kept in mind that you have to take uh, um, the proper treatment for all your underlying medical things. That being said, if they are forgetful, they might not even be taking their medicines. So somebody who's around them needs to be very watchful about what they are doing and how they're taking their medications. Are they filling it um, on time? Just check with the pharmacy. See, okay, are they just not filling it for a year and they just have all those pill bottles still there? Then something is wrong. They're not taking it the way they're supposed to take it. Sometimes if, if our parents give us the permission and they're okay with it and they want you to be involved in the care, they let you come to the doctor's, talk to their physicians about it see what they have to say how have they been what have you know they noticed and um, they will be able to guide you and help you with that um, a lot now this is a very interesting thing is how our brain has got different uh, sections or departments rather that it has for a uh, different kind of functioning that we do and memory and learning is like one department which um, which takes care of learning new information processing it there is a short-term memory there is a long-term memory and um that gets affected mainly with dementia, this memory and impair, uh, memory and learning domain. And then there are other things like language, which uh, there is a speech a area of a speech and language and the way we process information that comes to us and how we interpret it and then how we speak. So all of that is a complex process and how that gets interpreted is also there are certain um, areas that do that. Certain kinds of memory problems have language as a problem, but mind you, not all forms of dementia that, oh, they, they remember everything. Like they remember everything that I did when I was a child and they did what they were as a child, but they don't remember what what they did five minutes ago. That is a problem. The long-term memory can be intact for a very long time and the short-term memory can be the first thing impacted. If you are seeing that, definitely look into uh, seeking help and seeing because that's very common. A lot of people would be like, no, no, no. They remember everything. I'm like, what do they remember when I ask them? And they're like, oh, they can tell you what they did in high school and what they did in middle school. They, they remember their previous years very well but they have forgotten what, what is happening around them. Um, that's That can be concerning. When stroke happens, it can affect certain areas of the brain. And then the stroke, uh, people with stroke can always present with certain problems with their memory. It all will depend on what area of their brain was affected by their stroke, what kind of stroke it was. So those things can uh, be a challenge. So discuss that. Executive... Um, Executive function is a very interesting um, um, section of our memory and a very interesting role that our brain does is the planning, the execution. The, that can be a problem for people due to other reasons also all their life. So you have to be aware of if they had a problem all their life or this is something that's happening right now. The first, the few things you will see is somebody who was very functional, who was having a job 
even they are 65 and 70, they were still working. Now they cannot um, get to their work on time. They don't remember how to put their um, checks and their accounts and everything properly, how they used to do that before. They cannot manage their own bank accounts properly. They, uh, they miss the deadlines. They have bills to pay and things are just pending and piling and piling and they're not able to meet those deadlines in time, which they were, mind you, doing a year ago or two years ago. They were doing fine with all that. They were never having a problem in their life with meeting deadlines or uh, doing any things or getting places or doing certain, uh, remembering certain things. But now you notice this happening every time, every single time they are having certain things uh, that are triggers. So that, that really requires a certain um, evaluation. Complex attention, like our attention by itself now with this day and age with technology and everything around is divided and furthermore i don't know how when we become older adults how things will be with social media and with the technology around us but um, when you are having a conversation with somebody are they able to keep a track of the the, the topic or do they just wander off do they just go out to the topic and go somewhere else and they're not able to pay attention to what you're telling them? Or if you give them a complex task to perform, they're not able to perform that or repeat that back to you. Uh, they don't do that. Social, um, our ability to meet people and interact with them, um, go out, do certain things also is a very important function. And that is very important to us. Certain uh, things as we know that, you know, it's not okay to behave like this socially it is not okay to just go ahead and talk to people or use words which are not right um, a language which is not appropriate in another setting dress up in a particular way when you go to a certain place especially you can't just you won't go to a wedding in a, in a certain attire you won't go to a masjid in a certain attire there are certain things which are like that and when you start seeing these as um, somebody not doing that that can be a concern. There is a particular area of our brain which does this, um, the frontal lobe is very important for this. And when that gets affected in one, one kind of a uh, dementia, it really shows a great impact. And what we call, they've lost their filters. You know, the filters as in, they're able to filter what to do where, they don't know. They don't know. There's a time and place for everything that is gone. And you're like constantly, this is not this is not the time for this. This is not the place to talk like this. This is not the uh, thing to do. This, that can be um, a challenge. Also, um, emotions and managing our empathy towards things. Like if somebody has just passed away, you just don't go congratulate them and laugh. Right? That That would just be like, everyone would be looking at you like what's wrong with you what what did you just do um if somebody just does that that that's like inappropriate in that social setting so that is a trigger if something like that happens that empathy is gone they have complete uh, what we call apathy um they don't show the right feelings for the right time then there may be a challenge um going on in their brain and uh, motor functions and perceptual functions. This is more important in other forms because there are certain diseases like Parkinson's disease. Like um, there are brain uh, degenerative, what our nerve cells, the neurons are like thin wiring in our brain. When this wiring, I would say gets eaten up or it's not doing well, then certain problems happen. When you see your hands shaking, them moving slowly, not talking properly, being very slow, falling down, their, their gait is affected, handwriting is affected. That can be a feature of certain of these uh, dementias. And that is very important to um, kind of keep a check and eye on. So what these things and these functions, when one Initially, we said at least two of them, but now even if it is only one, even if it is just the memory that is affected, it is enough for us to um, go and um, try to find out what's going on there. 
to the extent that their functioning does get affected. So we will look into that more and do uh, certain different types of testing, which we'll talk about in a bit. But most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Like almost 5 million people in the United States at some point in time, um, they, they currently have, and these are old statistics. Um, so it has probably increased in its number recently. And especially in the later ages so 65 and plus at least six to eight percent people will have it and with every five years that they're going to live more their risk for getting the dementia doubles up so an 80 year old is or an 85 year old is is much more 45 percent more likely to have dementia so with this you know with the longer life um, we hope that our memories stay intact and we are able to carry out our functioning as we are but there could be certain subtle signs that we will have and what happens in this is our brain has got certain things which are proteins very complex structures which are amyloid beta amyloid proteins and tau proteins and they they get deposited in the brain in different areas and that is why this this process happens still researchers and scientists are looking a lot into dementia and trying to find out what is the exact cause there has also been a concern that this is like the diabetes of the brain like, you know, as um, slowly you have a sh problem with processing uh, certain uh, things with diabetes, the sugars, and the same way the the brain has got a problem with some with metabolism. And that is how it it um, it triggers this process of uh, dementia. But yet we are not able to find out a, a completely reversible um, treatment for this yet. But the good news is there is ways that we can prevent this. There are ways that we can keep this prolonged or we can push this more longer and keep it like that for a longer time. And that is what our aim should be also. Um, and as we spoke, thyroid um, problems, vitamin deficiencies, head injury, if you've fallen down, if you've had a, a stroke, thankfully, alhamdulillah for us, alcoholism not uh, doesn't uh, use that but here in the United States you see that very commonly uh, that alcohol has an effect on the brain and it just leads to uh, memory impairment and problems with functioning um, so the, the various types of dementia the most common is Alzheimer's disease and that is the biggest one that we are you know uh, looking at that we are hearing about in the news and everywhere and it is a very slow process it doesn't just come up one day your mother or father doesn't wake up not remembering you it is not a movie that happens like oh it's just gone the memory is gone one fine day and you wake up not remembering your entire family and everybody it doesn't happen like that it is a very slow process you start noticing one thing at a time more repetition comes more functioning decline goes they are um, slowly slowly not able to do things they were able to do before and this is the biggest thing I would take because not everybody is the education levels are same their environment is the same um, everyone has a different nature around them as we call and their nurture uh, is, is very different throughout their life and what was normal for them before is not another person's normal, but what you have to compare is with their normal. What was their normal before? Is this their normal now? That That is the most important part uh, that we want to look at. And um, there are medications, um, but I say that with a lot of... Um, the medications help you only to a certain extent to prolong the disease. The medications cannot reverse this process. They cannot reverse this process. No matter what, we are not there. There are certain newer medicines in the pipeline that are um, that are being uh, tried and tested, and FDA approved a couple of new ones. And then, um, but I have not personally used that in practice as well as, as seen because of the risks and the side effects. And then they had to go back again um, on their approvals. So we are still learning a lot about uh, medications in that aspect, and um, going forward with um, those. 
there is the vascular dementia, which I think is very common, especially in our communities, because we do see a lot of diabetes. We see a lot of blood pressure, high blood pressure, stroke um, in our communities and our family histories. Um, we have these things very commonly and they affect memory at a later stage. So, but the way they affect is maybe they had a stroke and then they went down. And then they again had something and then they went down and then they again had something and then they went down. But also sometimes Alzheimer's and this both can go together. So when they go together, it's very different, difficult to differentiate one from the other. But your tests like MRI can be a little helpful to um, show you what is going on there. Unfortunately, not many doctors now do, um, not many doctors do what is a functional MRI. Functional is where it can tell you what brain function is, is there, what brain function is affected. We don't do that to find out about dementia. Uh, how, how do we diagnose it? After this, I will uh, go a little bit into that. And there is a very two very different kinds of dementia, which is Lewy body and uh, frontotemporal. Those are just very big, big scientific names. But what you need to know is one of those, they start seeing things. So if somebody is just telling you, I am seeing where the, these children or these small, you know, things which are there and um, they just come and go, they are not seeing, um, you know, some weird things. They might be hallucinating. It is a possibility that they are going through some uh, memory uh, um, issue and they might be having um, Lewy body dementia, which is a very different uh, form. They might be having tremors or shaking, like their hands slowly, slowly are shaking and they're not able to walk properly and uh, talk, their speech is slow. This can be a problem. So don't take it lightly when they... Um, when somebody tells you like, you know, oh, this, this one came, what is that there? That can be a pro that can be a trigger for an investigation into it. And their medications are quite different, a little harder to treat, but definitely a very different route to go. And um, when the front of our brain, which is the frontal lobe, when that gets affected, it presents totally differently. It is it very common in a younger population, much much more before even 60 years of age. And they have a significant personality change. Whereas a person was completely um, a calm or composed or a different person, loving nature, doing certain things, they've suddenly become very aggressive or very uh, different, talking a language which is not right, sometimes even a very vulgar language, which people would be like, this has never been this person. He is a totally different human being right now. And um, their their emotions and their regulation is different from time to time. They're crying one moment, they're laughing loudly one moment. They're acting very, very different. That personality change is, is a very significant feature of this kind of dementia. And unfortunately, this progresses faster and it does not have much of a treatment. But... Uh, it is worth to look into that and to see uh, what is going on with them because everything is not normal aging. It is, you have to find out what's wrong. You may be able to get a lot of help to treat at least the things around them. Um, so um, looking for these signs, um, early is very important and talk to your primary care doctor because primary care doctor can do the initial diagnosis. They can uh, go ahead and um, do that initial Indra, workup that Indra, is needed. Was, yes? There was a couple of questions. On, yes. yes. I think one of them was they, somebody wanted to know about the kind of treatment that offers in dementia. I'm sure you're going to cover in a slide right here. There was another question from a mom which said, memory loss we got post-pregnancy. We feel often our memory is no longer what it used to be and we're loss of words or often forgetting or having a very hard time remembering things. What is the reason? How can we manage it? Did you want to cover a little bit of post-pregnancy forgetfulness? Uh, yes, let's, uh, let's just talk about uh, the diagnosis and the treatment right now uh, in a bit and then we'll uh, cover that in a little bit. Sounds Inshallah. So um, the testing, the testing is, is not a blood 
there are blood tests we want to you know do a blood test to find out if there is diabetes if there is other problems we want to make sure everything else is okay we want to check the vitamins especially the b vitamin b12 and the um, and um, and the vitamin d not so much but b12 definitely folate and b12 for sure and then uh, treat those if you find that definitely treat that and uh, see how they improve but um, the test is mainly like a memory test where it is like an exam question paper that you give to kids and um, when we start to do or talk to somebody in the clinic about that as um, uh, dr khan said they are very anxious they are like um, they are wanting to not do that or they are nervous about even answering and then that impacts their uh, performance on that evaluation itself so as a doctor in my clinic i do like a 30 question test most most commonly a 30 question test where we ask you different questions different things to remember um in repeat them and then uh, name us different like animals or uh, different words starting with a letter or or draw drawing a clock is a very interesting test um and that that gives us a very um important if people know to draw the clock that is another important thing like if you're if your elder doesn't know how to draw a clock and have never learned that then that is a problem um so we have to find out according to what they know and kind of gear it in their language try to find out in these different domains whatever best we can to be able to put these things together give them stories to remember and uh, things to um, just tell you back calculations drawing certain things and then um, following your directions repeating certain sent sentences all these things can give you a lot of information uh, about what is um, what is going on and what kind of memories impacted but the more detailed testing which is the most specific one is a neuropsychological testing and that is hard to get into expensive uh, not many people do that in um, in here in austin and um, it is a 3 to 4 hour long test it's like a booklet like you're going for an exam they're going to ask you multiple things and then at the end of it come up with what is going on um and then certain questions when we are asking them they are um they are very directed towards um asking you um certain things which can be impacted by things like your mood if you're not in a good mood that day if you didn't sleep well if you didn't do well it's it impacts your performance on an exam the same way it will impact on that so just taking that one test and giving somebody a diagnosis of dementia i don't think is appropriate you need to be putting two and two together with the whole family history with everything going on around them and then do one test repeat something um after a month or three months and then see how the progression is take it from the, that is the best way to go about it instead of just going ahead and jumping on to a diagnosis and starting multiple things ruling out depression anxiety is very 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 important because depression can present with something what we call as false dementia or pseudo dementia in older adults they don't come out with the symptoms of depression like the younger people do they are not interested in the most thing most common things are oh life is not worth living anymore i'm just too old all my friends are gone i can't do anything um i don't like doing anything anymore they're in their room they're closed they're not interacting with their peers not wanting to go out and doing certain things that can impact their memory by itself so treating that can sometimes reverse the entire process and you will see that the memory improves significantly having a lot of anxiety in somebody who has that personality as from the beginning can present with these um attention problems later on also so that can be very common so that's why look at what was their normal how is their normal affected that is very very important if they were anxious throughout their life treat the anxiety first the memory will already take care of itself 
you will see the improvement. You don't need to treat any medications for the memory at that time. Um, but definitely, uh, the doctors can um, do rule out and do certain things with that. So, and to answer the question about post-pregnancy, um, I would think that post-pregnancy with memory, there is a lot more complex than um, anything like this process that happens in dementia happening. That is more of um, lack of sleep, um, the mood changes, the um, it could be postpartum blues, postpartum depression, um, those things that can be, you know, the the diet, the the care for your own self, and those things can be a part of that memory um, loss compared to compared to dementia. That is not how you could explain that because this process is like like something is building up, like your like a pipeline, like your arteries get the clocks and over the time, the same way the brain gets something, you know, in it for a very long time. And that's why this kind of a problem with memory happens. Whereas post-pregnancy, I think it is completely different and you can fill in more, Dr. Khan. What do you think? Um, so definitely anxiety and depression, right? There's a lot of overlap with dementia. Um, but, but again, like... It, uh, Post-pregnancy, it gets better within six months. There's a lot of nutrition deficiencies that might lead to some of it. And as you sort of uh, feed yourself well, you're not sharing your nutrients with your baby, things start getting better. So that's one sign that you it usually comes back to normal within six months. Uh, anxiety and de depression, it comes with other symptoms, right? Like if, if you have forgetfulness, uh, this is the other part I was going to talk about, the neuropsych testing. Uh, about $3,000 out of pocket, a lot of people do it. Uh, with insurances should be zero. Quite a few places there. You should go through your insurance list and look for psychological testing and they should be able to do it. It's about 400 questions. They ask you, they bring you in, make you do a couple of tests. It takes about three to four weeks to get an appointment, four to five weeks to get that testing done and results out. So it helps to differentiate between if the forgetfulness, anxiety, depression is kind of part of it or uh, dementia. It doesn't not differentiate which kind of dementia you have. Although history should tell you if it's vascular dementia, it's Alzheimer's and all of those things. But uh, if you have depression and anxiety, you see those symptoms along with it. So with anxiety, you have the other symptoms of feeling restless, agitated, um, not able to sit in one place, panic attacks, worrying, rumination. Rumination, again, is such a common thing in dementia. They ask the questions again and again. That's often I get people saying, my mom and dad have been asking these questions again and again. Where are we going You've said it, but you've been saying that. But to differentiate it, that's how they present to me, right? Because they see that as anxiety and they're anxious and they're presenting. And then I have to kind of say, hey, maybe have you all looked into dementia? And then uh, depression comes with other lack of sleep, uh, poor sleep, um, not lack of interest, no motivation to do fun things, uh, negative thoughts, negative talk. That's how you can differentiate some of the depression versus dementia kind of things. So, and then the other part is the timing of the symptoms, right? Sun, sun downing symptoms of dementia. Uh, I'm sure you see that a lot, right? Yeah, that is um, sun downing or uh, there is something called as delirium. If you have, if you have somebody who has a memory problem, you will cert sometimes be able to note it more when there's a sudden change happening. Like during the evenings, they're different. Um, they're more confused. They're um, forgetting, you know, things more towards that time. Or when a completely new situation happens, like they've been living with you for seven, eight years, you know, for a very long time, and then suddenly go live with another child. And then they're like, oh, what is wrong with my parent? You know, they're totally different. They're not able to adjust. They're not able to uh, function in that environment. Their routines change. Things go very differently. And that time, they're not able to cope up. That can be um, a problem with dementia. They could be having dementia. You just haven't noticed it when they were in a in a proper routine. And that brings us to the point to talk that, you know, how do you care for these people um, who have dementia? Having a proper routine, having like you have for children, that helps them. That keeps them also in a very uh, stable setting. Their mood is fine. They're uh, not having a lot of um, 
anger or irritability or any problems and uh, they're calmer they're able to they eat they do their you know they take their things they follow a pattern and that's it but when their routine changes when you break that that's that brings them a lot of anxiety and anxiety and depression like depression by itself is associated with dementia like it can be a part of it in the later stages of dementia you can see people getting depressed they um they get more anxious also because they're not able to remember and do things that brings the anxiety by itself like i was able to you know do all of this and now i'm become dependent and i can't remember and they're they're worried that they have to take care of all these things they multiple times before they can do something and that brings a lot of anxiety they're nervous more than anything to miss those deadlines to miss those things to not remember they're writing down more commonly they're doing things differently um that could be a trigger for their anxiety so having a team around you like especially if you are you know all your family members getting together and seeing okay this is how we will take care of this this is how we will help uh, mom or dad uh, do different things you know um let's have this routine for them let's try to do this with them um bring them out um and do certain things with them taking them how do you slow this process or help them more is diet changes and exercise diet has a lot of um a lot of study into it um that changing one's diet and eating a good balanced mediterranean style of diet that does that has the most research and the most support and there is also certain um articles that i was reading for like a keto based diet to help but when now as we are using this more we are seeing some side effects of keto so i would not suggest to you know do one particular thing but to follow a mediterranean style pattern and if you ever look into um online for what is that it has got a pyramid it is like a pyramid what should be your everyday food and then what you should avoid the next then slowly 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 coming down to the end and that is what we want to eat that is how we want to eat eating a complete balanced diet is going to help them and um there's no one particular thing that is you know shown to reverse there was a lot of questions when we were uh, studying like coconut oil or turmeric supplementation or there is some other supplements over the counter which will say oh memory boosting you know things but there is not a lot of research and support for them um turmeric and curcumin are being studied and we use them in our diet but that's not enough you have to have a little more than the what we use in the diet is very very less um when you take those they can decrease the inflammation and uh, the inflammatory markers and help slow the process to certain extent and that can be a possibility and antioxidants just in general eating the berries and um the foods which are very rich the colorful foods um the different colors in the rainbow that can be very good for your brain now um, most important another thing is as a caregiver what do you do because a lot of us who are taking care of these um, people with memory issues they get they get burnt out and how do you take care of them because you can imagine for a child you can teach them you can teach them new things you can teach them what is right and what is wrong but when your parent is doing certain things which are not appropriate or not right and you have to be the one stepping up and telling them you know this is not right or they're like oh, you're my child i raised you you are the one telling me what to do and what not to do that's not you know how is that possible now so that role reversal can be very uh, challenging and it can be difficult for the caregivers at times to um tell them what to do and what not to do try to get your physician on board whoever the doctor involved whoever is the care try get them on board let them be the bad guy sometimes i have to be the person telling them hey you can't take care of your medicines you have to live with somebody or you have to do these things certain things that i'm telling you to because it is for their safety it if you don't let them do that they can have a lot of problems because dementia comes in stages as they are going to live longer they will go from a milder stage to a moderate to a very 
bad stage and the severe, in the severe stage how this progresses is from mild we just see okay they are having a little impact and then slowly suddenly the impact is much more where you cannot see them you know uh, do any activities that they were doing cooking cleaning whatever they were doing after a while you will see them completely go down to a severe stage and that stage is something what we call back to the fetal stage like as you came from the womb of the mother in that fetal you know stage that is how you start going back you stop eating you stop walking it is sad to see that last stage of dementia in that severe form but they forget to eat they forget what was eating they forget how to talk they forget how to walk they are in bed and they like curled up like they were as a child so that that is the progression of the disease that is how severe it can get if it ever if they ever live to that if they don't have any other issues and they make it to that stage but that is how the progression is it is over the course of many years it is over 8 10 even 15 20 years but it it progresses it progresses like that and then it is sad to see that they forget you know their own children they call them with one name one day the other name another day and then they're like who are you why are you not coming or forgetting your own spouse it is very hard to live with this challenge but again remember this is their disease this is the illness this is not them if you take that out you will have a lot of ease in caring for that person this is their disease you have to remind yourself multiple times this is not my spouse this is not my parent this is their disease talking this is their because we can be very frustrated if i asked you in during this session only oh what did you eat no two minutes later again like what did you eat you haven't had had anything take it can be very frustrating how to answer this, these questions same thing again and again um sundowning as you said you know in the evening they are like let's go where this is daytime let's go out let's do something or they're just walking off they're wandering off and they want to drive if somebody is driving that can be a very very dangerous thing they've got into multiple accidents when they're driving alone it's a big sign for you to get them evaluated and see what is wrong with your parent why are they getting into so many accidents why are they forgetting which places they went to um the addresses that they remembered before they cannot find they get lost easily that is a problem st david's here has got a memory uh, driving evaluation um a test that they can do and i think they're the only center in austin who does that uh, so far that i know but a uh, doctor can refer there and if you're very concerned and if you have somebody who is very stubborn and says no i'm going to drive i'm going to i need to do all all these things then you need to have them have a driving evaluation sometimes and then say no you're not you're not able to you're not fit you know to. the hardest part on that is with family members are really high functional intelligent strong minded parents uh, yes. who are in denial themselves accident doesn't have to be a car accident right sort of forgetting yeah. things and doing and so often i see people who have kind of gone to a very severe stage of uh, forgetfulness and dementia and haven't been picked up because they are very good at kind of yeah fabulation is them. Them. yeah verbal so intact just, because they yeah. as we call them you know uh, especially um education and yes. intelligence is a uh, plays a big part of um, pushing the memory issues you know beyond also and somebody who is intelligent like you know somebody who has a phd who has been functioning and working for 70 years of their life they can present very differently um, and they cannot they will keep this dementia hidden for many many years before you can even diagnose them many many years before we can diagnose and the test that they would require is not just the, a test with a physician they might be one who requires that 3 to 4 hours of complete neuropsych evaluation it is very hard to diagnose these people but when you see somebody like that sometimes the doctors being the bad guy helps and i have you know i have done that i have learned that from my uh, training that you have to be very persistent of saying no you need to give your keys you really need to the other thing that if they are very severe what what can happen and what can benefit sometimes is just telling them the car is not there anymore the car is gone it's in the garage because if they are you know they're doing something that is very very dangerous to themselves the chances are they will forget 
and they will ask you again next day they'll ask you 100 times in a day but it's like oh you remember it's it's, it's not there don't say you remember but it, it's not there it's not there it's going to come it's going to come chances are they're going to forget again again they're going to ask you so arguing or you know trying to tell them that uh, this is this is um something that is going to happen um you know we are going to know this is not right you're not correct i am the one who's correct here will not help a person who is who has dementia you just have to just tell them that yes this is okay you know we'll do this later or if they want to leave in the middle of the night and wander off calm them sit with them if they are just having a sudden attack of something and they want to just leave the home you can say you know just calm them and sometimes you might be able to talk to them and say like it's night we'll leave in the morning why don't you right. just and go to sleep? i mean even as as things we age we lose some of our functionality it kind of is very personality changing and it is hurtful so, so having to accept something this big is so much harder for them and yasmin has a good question she says as our elders progress into dementia uh, and they do not acknowledge their dementia how do we keep them at ease is there any recommended medication to keep them at ease i think the best um, the best thing we can do is probably sometimes is you know as there is a stigma with everything else there is a big stigma with the word dementia and alzheimers trust me if i have to tell somebody that you you have alzheimers disease they sometimes it's a big big problem they're like oh my god what how did i get that but you could tell them they have diabetes they'll be like that's fine but i don't have this problem you know i don't have alzheimer that's 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 good news but um as they age the best thing is to make them that they are safe um they are not doing things which are dangerous to them if they are getting their care team involved to do something different would help uh, giving them the nutrients making sure they have enough vitamin b12 folate vitamin d um even omega fatty acids and um some melatonin again melatonin has a lot of good and bad things with it it is not something that we you know we want to recommend all the time because we don't see a lot of um, benefits of it with the sleep and um, you know circa as we call the day and night pattern but it is a hormone that our body releases uh, to keep us you know differentiate the days from the night so if they are having that problem then probably giving them something like that in the evening time so that they can they can sleep better and that can be helpful and um taking them out in the nature we have something called as a sensory areas now when we were doing in the memory unit um and it is very interesting how the elders who have dementia they respond and they are much calmer in calmer environments where there is like this um nice um, birds in the background or like uh, they see bright fishes something like that they are much more calmer and um they they are able to you know just quran for instance if you slowly are playing the quran and they might be very calm with it they take what is in their surroundings so keeping your surroundings calm and you being calm yourself might have a big impact on them if they're not able to accept them you know accept their diagnosis because that can be very challenging especially when as a child you want to help them and you know let them acknowledge it and do something about it but they're not um, ready to yet until yeah benzos are definitely not a choice benzodiazepines because no. there's such a fall risk with that no. so things like xanax is clonazepam wouldn't recommend even benadryl that. even benadryl i would not recommend to give them so don't give them a tylenol pm they're going to wake up groggy they're going to wake up more confused in the morning so tylenol pm advil pm and so many people take that commonly like benadryl is taken very magnesium commonly magnesium definitely is a great choice right magnesium i kind of feel like has a lot of sleeping calming uh, property i don't i don't know the magnesium does have a lot of talk now uh, that we know um, but again i would be careful of shan using magnesium in older adults who have renal dysfunction 
Yeah. Because you have to be very careful giving this, especially somebody who has kidney problems. Because we see a lot of our patients have diabetes and they have all these things and their kidney function is already affected. So you have to be a little bit careful there when you're giving uh, magnesium. magnesium. But again, magnesium. doing uh, calmer things, like you know, if they they take a bath or something, like a calm, warm bath in the evening, just relaxing and then putting dim lights not having bright lights, making sure the days and the nights are very well differentiated for them. Like having okay. a brighter day in the home, bright lights in the home, and then at night making it quite dark. And um, keeping that really helps people with um, dementia to keep them, you know, what very What about calm. L-theanine? You know, I use a lot of L-theanine over-the-counter supplement for anxiety um, for kids and adults. I know there is a lot of uh, research with that with the adults and the kids, but not especially in uh, dementia, we don't. Sure. And somebody yeah. had a question with um, Dunepezil and Mimantine. So Dunepezil, uh, these are the medicines that we have approved right now, both these medications and a couple of other things also like rivastigmine and um, um, some others which are available. But Dunepezil and Mimantine are the most common prescribed medications for dementia. They are what they do is they are uh, they work on the acetylcholine uh, receptors and they increase their cholinesterase inhibitors and they will increase those um, chemicals in our brain to be able to help. But these will not reverse the process. These will slow. In a lot of cases, you might see a decrease in their um, anxiety behavior, their anger, their irritation when you start these medications. But some, they have side effects. And um, donepezil is something that is given in the earlier stages and combining memantine in the later times of dementia is what is recommended so far. And these are the most common ones in practice that I have used over the years. In, but they do have their side effects of um, stomach issues, diarrhea, uh, dizziness. So they they can be very uh, challenging to use, but they don't reverse the process. They do not. They don't. Um, they will slow the progression of the disease for many many years, which is an advantage. So you should. There is a reason to start them because they do slow the process uh, for a very long time, and you could keep that memory like this, and uh, for a while. And I think it it's like I mean I know you're talking about the identifying caregiver stress caregiver support is a big thing if we are calmer anxiety is transferable so transferable i feel it's as contagious as cough you are anxious you get overwhelmed and then they pick on those vibes kids adults older people everyone everyone um, i mean any we, anybody in general but you know yeah. as as we know with kids they do that very commonly they sense it the same thing happens with adults and especially people with dementia, they sense it. They can see right. that. So if you are cheerful and you're happy, for instance, we ha I had a, um, somebody I was taking care of and they were in a home, in a in a foster home. And whenever, very advanced, very advanced. But when we, you would go with a smile and a cheer and a happy, jolly mood and you'd just be there, that person would be very different. But otherwise, the caregiver, the caregivers would be like, they're grumpy, throwing objects, doing certain things. And it's, it's very common. They take UT it Health Sciences has a um, UT Austin Health Sciences has a great dementia caregiver support program. They, you know, so I think that's they actually see just caregivers. Um, and that is very important for caregivers to be able to have help, to have support, talk to other caregivers. Um, there can be, if you have insurance, there can be home health people, you know, like somebody who can offer a few hours every day to come in your home and take care of the adult and you can go out, you can step out to take care of yourself. Um, there is even respite care. I don't know we how many of us would use it and feel comfortable putting somebody in a nursing home for five days and go on a vacation. But that is available. Medicare um, does have that available for older people to do. So those things are possible. And when they're not able to bathe, they're not able to do something like that, you can get help. So talk to your doctors about it and see what can be done. People can come to your home they can help you. They can help them move. They can help them do some therapy in the home, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, get them different kind of objects that they would need. So they, when they're shaking, they have different plates and different bowls and different spoons and things like that to eat, drink from um, evaluating their speech. And, and there is like speech therapy can also help with uh, playing like 
memory games and puzzles and things with them that can keep their memory intact for a bit and that that can be very very helpful to do these things um as they are um as you're aging and especially you know for the caregivers because we see caregiver distress as such a common thing and this is very ignored because we we in a cultural setting that we grow up we do not want to um not take care of our of our older adults but at the same time you need to understand you need to take care of yourself so you're able to take care of them if you are not in a state to take care of them both of you both of the caregiver and the um the person is going to suffer so it is very important and then alzheimer's association has very good resources there is um i had put this in um and you know we're going to share this so you, you should have access to this um this and there is this alz.org and they give you all the recent ones especially with the medications that somebody was asking there were two of these newer medications that are approved and they are there on there so um if they are they are having more support and they are proven to be safer the you we will see them being used more and then we can see but all these information is updated on this alz.org and it's a very good website and resource to look at um and then the book is there's a 30 36 hour and there's a lot of hope for medication too i know eli lily stocks going up because they have two new meds coming out yes, called they, they, that's so they, they have two new medications in the pipeline and um those yeah. are those are yeah. really um good news for uh, all that for alzheimers them. yeah so you have a uh, local areas for you know centers for aging and they can give you a lot of resources there are even adult daycares where they can go for a few hours and then come back and um those things can be a possibility for them so we can get help from our local centers uh, we don't use them very commonly but those those can be very very helpful and also for yes. older adults to find like seniors to find other seniors because when i see seniors in my clinic a lot of times they want somebody they just need somebody to sit and talk to they just want somebody to share everything with they just want that social support they just want uh, someone to be there and um, with our busy lives and things being very different they you know they can feel neglected sometimes so that can happen so we should just go ahead and see how how we can have more seniors to support each other or have a gathering for them at some point in time you and- know at some point um seva seva is a non muslim indian asian i think ish yes um, a south asian south asian uh, organization uh, program yeah. that does a great job of a lot of volunteers and i know somebody in our community jia jabbar she runs royal event she wanted to kind of do something for a muslim community in a similar way we didn't have a lot of response but she's very keen if she gets more volunteers and people who are keen on to start something where they can do senior trips uh from a mosque um do things together for them that they can meet other people and get out to socialize and everybody can chip in and kind of volunteer that'd be a good project if one of the caregivers want to take on i'm happy to kind of connect her with her because she's very keen on doing something like that but she doesn't have enough support uh, or re- um, volunteers to kind of start that program mm-hmm. that'd be a good thing to do i have a, another question which is a really good question i have social anxiety and depression i've been using citalopram since many years do i have a higher chance to get dementia or alzheimers uh, you know it's a lot anti citalopram is an antidepressant anxiety medication we've been studying for years 20 plus years so it's a very old medication and as far as they know or they've known there's not been any no. way it causes dementia uh, in any way in fact i think it may be a little more protective because dementia is again some of it is genetic um some of it is environmental but if you have social anxiety and depression and you change your lifestyle unmedicated versus medicated it plays a role so if you're taking a medication and able to go and engage in things that treat your depression chances are it might that lifestyle might change your chances of not getting dementia versus if you don't take your medication that might prone you because you're not engaging in a lot of social activity not engaging your brain so much that possibly might have an opposite effect so if anything i would think citalopram is protective against having dementia than causing dementia i don't know that what your thoughts are on uh, it well i would want to i don't know about like directly being protective but as you said indirectly um because you're able to care for yourself better it is not clearly linked with dementia okay that is certainly there the medications that are linked are um 
benzodiazepines like your um, uh, Xanax or um, Clonopin or those, those are linked. Those are linked. The other things that are linked with dementia are pain medications um, that I had to uh, mention. Somebody who's on pain medications for a very long time, we, we don't commonly see that here um, in our uh, cultural population, though I have not. But uh, in the Caucasians, do you see that very commonly um, is that they've been on opiate kind of medications for a very long time, which is like hydrocodone or um, um, oxycodone, tramadol, for a very long time and they can have a higher chance of getting dementia uh, in their later life. But as you said, uh, living a healthy lifestyle and uh, learning new things and growing intellectually are the two most protective things against dementia. So if you are going to constantly have this growth mindset, mindset and grow and learn new things um, and take care of your exercise and your diet, the less chances of dementia. So those are the only two protective things so far we have seen. So that that might actually, citalopram might be helping that. So taking care of yourself, would definitely, you know, I think that would be, as Afshan said, probably in uh, helpful rather than getting dementia. There's no clear link with uh, that and dementia. Um, somebody's requesting more information. I think we are going to share this. Um, this is being recorded. And inshallah, like, going I'm to Masina, I just put that information. I typed the Seva is also on Facebook and Jia Jabbar. She's pretty, uh, she does a lot of events like the Eid Mailers. She's on um, Facebook too, if you want to contact her. And the answer to your second question about sertraline, sertraline is just like Same, citalopram. Exactly. Yeah, it is like citalopram. So again, these and these are medicines which actually are very commonly used in dementia also. Uh, something that I should mention is we see something which you will also notice is behavioral changes in dementia. So, um, you know, sleep is different. Their behavior is different. Your Older people, they get angry very easily, irritable very easily. And for some some of these features that the donepezil, the memantine, those things don't help. So we take help of these, um, as we call them SSRIs in our medical terminology, or Zol sertraline or Zoloft or citalopram, escitalopram. Um, and even another medication, I don't know how much uh, you use it, um, Afshan, is uh, mirtazapine. Um, I... I Lot, I like that. Lot. I like that Great in my older population, population. Uh, because I use a very, and again, my rule in older people, treating older people in any kind of disease is start low and go slow. Don't want to start a lot of medications. Keep polypharmacy to the minimal. The lesser the drugs, the better. Don't give them more over-the-counter medications thinking they're going to help. Consult your doctor because even certain things like um, antacids, then Zyrtec, then you add a Benadryl, then you add another thing. So these are things which are anticholinergic medications and they can all lead to confusion in the, in the older people. So these, these are not very safe medications. In the And there's a big list. Um, we It's called Beer's List of Medications. It's very interesting, but it has pretty much every medicine on it. Um, that, you know, you should not be giving this, you should use with caution in the older population. And a lot of medicines are there. So um, we have to be cautious on our medication use. At the same time, where it is needed, we should use it, but at a keep them low as much, whatever we can, and uh, to keep them uh, stable. Again, sleep, you know, sleep is a problem and mirtazapine helps very well. The other thing I do want to mention and educate, if you can take this from here, is a sleep apnea. If you have an adult who snores at night, who wakes up in the middle of the night feeling out of air, who is tired through the day, who is sleeping excessively during conversations, dozing off, snoring a lot loudly, please talk to your doctor about a sleep study. It can be done in the home now. So it's a very easy test to do. Overnight sleep study, it can be, you know, you can bring it home. There's a very simple test. You submit it back, they look at it, and then you can get further evaluation because if you treat sleep apnea, you can, um, sleep apnea is associated with dementia. It can lead to cognitive impairment and that can be reversible. So we want to look at these reversible causes as much as we can before we can, you know, um, we can't change the genes. We cannot change what is there. 
um, we can't change what happened in the past, but definitely we can look for these things and treat them as much as we can. So sleep apnea, please, uh, if somebody's suspecting, get that treated, it is a life changer. Um, it can help you be more energetic, more focused, more um, more sharp in, in the day if you are having sleep apnea, because sleep is a very, very important part of our um, lifestyle and we ignore it with our our lifestyle and our social way of living you know weekends we sleep long we stay up late weekdays we work differently we are more awake to meet deadlines it doesn't help our body it doesn't help our uh, productivity our mind it, it it's you have to take care of your sleep and that is a very important part of it and I also wanted to mention that um, medications like um, the sertraline, the citalopram, um, the, the sertraline especially, much more safer um, to be used in the older population. What do you think? Definitely. Metazepine is my choice of in elderly population compared to Zoloft or citalopram because it has a side effect of increased appetite and good sleep. So yeah. it targets a lot of things. But Zoloft, citalopram... Certainly, all these medications have well studied over years. Yeah. And like Mosina said, yes, less medicine, lower dose, always starting that way, working through environmental changes, you know, treatments are high, 30% meds, 30% therapy, 30% kind of changing environment, 10% doing the work. You got to put all of those together. You can't rely just on medication. No, you and medication. If you're going to think that this is this is like your um, other blood pressure that you're going to treat one and uh, with a medicine and see the number go down, you're going to be disappointed. Have a very realistic approach towards this problem. It is it is not one factor. There are many things, and when you change the entire thing, um, as you said, you know all those different things, then you do see the big big change. Awesome. The, Thank you. Nadra. The this only other one thing is um, one information I do want people to uh, know is um, if you are having a lot of concerns about um, their functioning and um, to the extent of their functional decline and you need somebody to they don't have what we call decision making capacity. They cannot understand the cause and effect. What is the consequence of not taking a medicine? What is the consequence of driving like that? What is the consequence of doing certain things in certain ways? They, if if the older adult is elder is not able to understand this, consult an attorney. They have they are specialized in. There are elder lawyers who are specialized in this field who can help you, who can direct you in in a direction where you need to go with uh, taking uh, you know some control over them. It can be challenging, especially with um, somebody who is you know highly functional, as uh, Afshan said that it is you know somebody who's been practicing something for 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 instance you know probably you and I Afshan I don't know what will happen when we get older you know because if we've been in practice for so many years and the, we subhanallah it can be very challenging to fight somebody like that and uh, do something different so elder lawyers can be very helpful um, getting planning ahead with them and knowing what their what their goals are how they want their care at the end of life is very helpful. And I think each one of us should think about that. How do we want our end to look like? Um, do we want, you know, the talk to them about whether they want to be resuscitated, do, do something. Those are topics which which are very important. I talk to my patients very early as soon as I see, you know, when I have a relationship with them, I, I bring this topic on very early. Not because I am... Um, expecting something wrong to happen sometimes but because I want to know their wishes I want to honor their wishes want to know what they would want them you know themselves to be looking like do they want to be in a hospital on a ventilator do something when they are in this state absolutely not do they want to have feeding tubes if they're not eating or doing something they probably don't whereas family members can be in a conflict where you know you want everything to be done how can you let let the let a father die like this or a mother do like this you know that it's not possible we got to do everything but sometimes doing less uh, in dementia is very helpful so i do want that to be um something that you know everyone should take away that think about these things it's not wrong it is it is good it's part of our of our deen also why we have to plan we have to plan well and then then 
then it's Allah's plans definitely, but we have to do our part. So think about these things early on. That's right. The two other quick questions before we end. Um, Masina had a difference between dementia and amnesia. And then diagnosed with PTSD, CPTSD has a higher chance to get dementia in future. Any connection? I can say about the PTSD, CPTSD, they haven't found anything with dementia or any connection of higher chances of dementia at all with PTSD or uh, chronic PTSD. So, but do you want to tell a little more about dementia and amnesia and how they're neurologically different? Amnesia is mainly just like a short term a forgetfulness, which could be due to due to any kind of a very acute process, which could be medication, it could be a, a sudden, uh, like a stroke or a sudden what we call transient ischemia or something like that. And then it comes back um, is what I would think. Whereas dementia is a very slow process. It goes over the period of years where you are slowly having amnesia, but forgetting, but but things, they, they're not going to come back to you. It's not reversible. It is not going to come back to you. It is slowly going to decline. Whereas an amnesia is just a shorter episode. Um, and I'm not very 100%, you know, on that. But amnestics are just for you to not remember that for a short term. And then it come, it's it's gone. It's like, just like when you're in a surgery, you're given a medicine to have amnesia of that surgery. So you do not remember what the surgeon did to you. That's not going to come back. Your brain was made to to not remember that particular thing. It is not going to come back to you. And then after that, you're going to be fine. You're going to be that individual that you were before. Whereas dementia, it's a it's a process that is slowly going to make you forget certain things. And uh, sometimes you will come in and out of it. This is the most interesting part about dementia is people get confused because it's like they're fine one day and they're not fine the other day. How does that happen? That can happen. That can be very normal. They come in and out of these, what we call a waxing and waning stage. And that can be very common. And there's something else medically, which is very important to also rule out is when they're doing fine and then they suddenly become very different one day, then they may be having some other problem. It could be pain. It could be constipation, an infection, something else going on that has triggered that confusion. Once you treat that thing, it goes away. Or if they're in the hospital, it's called delirium. And it is very common. It's very easy, simple, reversible process. They come in, in and out of their confusion. But once they're treated with the base underlying problem, it completely goes away. I hope that answers some, some of that question. There will and be I, a recording of this coming out. I uh, don't know if the person who wanted it in Urdu is still available, but I'm happy to just give them a gist if they still wanted it. No, I d let me see. Same. And then can we opt to put a sleep mercy cleaning allowed to be added in the will? Is this medical, legal, legal? That's probably not a question for us, but I don't know. Nidra, do you want to answer that? It, uh, no, no. Um, um, well, I don't see the, the sleep. Uh, but definitely, the as I said, they do not resuscitate, the uh, do not intubate. You can have, do not, you know, do not um, do feeding tubes, do not do certain kind of procedures, certain kind of things. Those are definitely there. Let nature take its course. Mm -hmm. That That is something. And then I don't know if anybody has ever heard of hospice, but hospice in severe dementia is a qualifying diagnosis. Like hospice is something that is... Um, that is there we usually very commonly hear it in cancer and other terminally ill um, people but in, even in severe dementia when we see them declining and when they're losing weight very rapidly and things are they're not moving and they're in, in bed um, the elderly can qualify for hospice so if you're at that uh, that stage that can be something to look at and that is just a, a very good way of uh, uh, being very non, um, completely non-aggressive and um, doing palliation at that time. And you don't poke and prick into anything. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nudrat. This is a very important type topic. Really appreciate. Oh, no, I'm, all this I'm glad this is, this is my one of the I love doing. Uh, 
you know this practice in my clinic and diagnosing and and as much as i would love more primary care physicians and everybody else to you know also feel more comfortable i think it's the comfort also um of the physicians to be able to diagnose this early and start treatment and then get you the right kind of help because um otherwise the neurologist takes a lot of burden of it um the psychiatrists see a lot of it um and we're all mixed into you know this and and there are other underlying things which need to be ruled out so those are very very important um all right it's my honor and pleasure alhamdulillah so i have put my email address in case anybody has any other questions um you know i am happy to help the community as best as i can inshallah assalam zakala ayakum so with that we conclude today's session inshallah thank you assalam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh